sun splashed afternoon in Goodyear, Arizona. And yes, indeed, Cactus League Baseball comes your way again today. And again, it will be the Cincinnati Reds taking on the Cleveland Indians from Goodyear Ballpark. Hi right, again, everybody. And back with Chris Welsh and Jim Day. I'm Tom Brenneman. Delighted to have you with us on this Wednesday afternoon. And today, a very special treat or treats, if you will. We get a look, Chris, at two of the most highly touted prospects, not only in the Reds organization, but in all of Major League Baseball. Oh, golden arms, no doubt about it. Robert Stevenson, a former number one draft pick, a very hard thrower. He's touched 100 miles an hour in the minor leagues. And Cody Reed, a left-hander that came over the Johnny Cueto trade from Kansas City. Both of these guys expect to be in the major leagues in some time in 2016. The question is, the arrival date, we don't know yet, but they certainly have the arms to be up here. Well, it's going to be exciting to watch. We're just getting warmed up here in Arizona. And when we come back, we'll get a look at Robert Stevenson. He'll take the ball as the Reds are the home team today. You're watching Reds Baseball on Fox Sports Ohio. Hey, what's this? Sure. The afternoon. Let's check in and say hello for the first time today to our main man down in the Reds dugout, Mr. Jim Day. Hello, James. Hello there, Tom. Robert Stevenson, as gifted as an arm as we have seen. If you talk to coaches and scouts, they say it's all about strike zone command and consistency for him. And I talked to Robert, and he agrees. There's obviously days where I go out there and I feel like I can pitch at any level. It doesn't matter who's up, who's at the plate. I can get them out. But then there's days where, you know, I, I don't feel like anything's going right. And I think it's just the, uh, just being able to limit those days and have more of the successful days and, um, and just being consistent is, is what's going to make me, um, you know, a lot more successful and being able to pitch at that big league level. And gentlemen, Brian Price says the changeup that Robert Stevenson has developed is a difference maker going forward and didn't rule out him making the club out of spring training, but would, in a perfect world, like to see him have success at AAA. But it all starts real today. Jim, thank you very much. You know, it's interesting, Chris. You, you talk about that changeup, and as the story goes, Mark Riggins, who now is a first-year major league pitching coach, he was the roving minor league pitching coach. 
Apparently Robert Stevenson before last year went to him and said, look, I want to go back to the old way I used to throw that change up. And Riggins said, okay, as long as you work with your grip a little bit to relieve some of the pressure on your arm. They found a happy median and you have a real good year. Oh, you're right. I mean, in order to have a, a good changeup, you have to have a good feel for it. And Robert worked with a split finger change and never really got the hang of it. You know, it's very much mirrors the same story of Homer Bailey, who worked with a conventional type changeup for a long time, never got the hang of it, decided to start throwing a splitter, and then it really worked for him. But he's got the fastball. There's no doubt about it. And he is a uh, very interesting young man to watch. The former number one draft pick that the Reds picked up out of high school, uh, at a high school just north of San Francisco. In high school, he threw back-to-back -back no hitters, and uh, he has been a top prospect ever since. Facing the leadoff man, the Indians third baseman, Jose Ramirez, and it's three balls. Make it two balls and a strike to Ramirez as we are underway in Goodyear. You know, the one thing that I have noticed about Robert Stevenson this spring, Tom, and it, it happens a lot when you grab a kid out of high school and he begins to start pitching pitches and innings in minor league baseball, his delivery is much more fluid now than it's ever been before. If you just look how he finishes up, somewhat square to the plate, not falling off the mound, out of control towards first base. It used to be that when he would rear back, he'd tilt his shoulders so much that he would be inconsistent in getting his arm through. All of that has been smoothed out. 3-2 pitch and a fastball is swung on and fouled out of play. It'll stay at three balls, two strikes. Let's take a look at that windup. Well, it's really under control. A very small step back, a control drive to the plate, but a real long stride. He's got one of those arms that scouts like to call a quick arm action. He gets it out of his glove, and before you know it, it's right up behind his right ear. Fly ball straight away center field. One of the stars yesterday, if not the biggest star for the Reds in his first game in the organization. Scott Shebler makes a catch, one out in the inning. Take a look at the lineup today defensively for the Reds. Winker, another top prospect, will start in left. Shebler and Jorman Rodriguez. The Eugenio Suarez, tall Peraza. We've heard so much about him. And Brandon Allen over at first. Ramon Cabrera hanging the signs for Robert Stevenson. Three years in a row, this 2011 first-round draft pick has been ranked by Baseball America as the number one prospect in the Reds organization. Go, Last two years, he attended Major League Spring Training Camp as a non-roster invitee. 27th pick overall, as Chris mentioned back in 2011. One of the real stars last year for the Indians after they finally made the decision to bring him to the major leagues, Francisco Lindor. Boy, what a rookie year he had. He finished second in the American League Rookie of the Year balloting. Yeah, one of the really up-and-coming stars in all of Major League Baseball. Terrific defender, speedy on the base pass, has some power if he gets his pitch. And he's also a number one draft pick. So you're really looking at top prospect versus top prospect here when Stevenson and Lindor square off. Yeah, they were in the same draft in 2011. Lindor was the number eight pick overall. He was born in Puerto Rico, but grew up and played high school baseball in the state of Florida. Oh, there's that change up. pitch right there. Well, when you can buckle a guy by throwing nearly 100 miles an hour, and there have been times in the minor leagues that Stevenson has reached that point. But in the major leagues, you need something to get him off your fastball, and that is an excellent pitch. Again, it's a matter of going from a more conventional changeup, whether it's a palm ball or a circle change grip, to a splitter. And the reason that Mark Riggins, the pitching coach, doesn't want Stevenson to fall in love with it is because splitters have been known to put pressure on the elbow. Case in point, and I don't know whether it was caused, it, it, that was the cause of Homer Bailey's injury to his elbow that required Tommy John surgery, but, you know, Bailey has been throwing a splitter over the last few years. Back-to-back -back fastballs missing up and away to Jason Kipnis, two-time All-Star Cleveland second baseman, will turn 29 
the day before opening day this year. Grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. <laughs> Kibnis originally played college baseball at the University of Kentucky, but then transferred to nearby Arizona State University. The Indians drafted him in the second round of 2009. Came right after him again, two and two. <laughs> Trying to put the Indians away in order. Oh, I didn't miss by much with a fastball off the outside edge. Brian Price has said point blank. Don't assume that Stevenson or Cody Reed or any of these highly touted young Reds pitchers are going to the minor leagues and don't write it in stone that they will break into the major leagues as starters. There's ball four to Kipnis. You know, Dusty Baser used to talk about it all the time. He'd harken back to his Dodger days when guys like Pedro Martinez and Ken Howell and there were others that first came to the major leagues as relievers. And Brian Price has not ruled that avenue out for some of these talented young Herbs. You know, it's funny, though, because in years past, the Reds have been reluctant to move guys along maybe too quick. Right. They, they've been more conservative in trying to get a young player developed in the minor leagues than make a mistake by bringing him to the major leagues too soon. And if they decide to bring a guy like Stevenson or Cody Reed or any of the pitchers, say, we saw yesterday, guys like Chris O'Grady, for instance, for Rule 5 draft, uh, that would kind of go out of the bubble for them a little bit. And maybe that is an indication that this really is a rebuilding year and that you know that these guys are eventually going to have to take their knocks around at the Major League level. Might as well do it this year. When it goes, throw by Cabrera is not going to be in time. And Kipnis with a stolen base. Well, that's one part of the game that Robert Stevenson has worked on a lot, and he still has a ways to go. And I'm talking about shutting down the running game, being a little bit compact. He had a very, actually, I didn't put a, a timer on him that time, but that looked like a pretty quick move and compact move to the plate for Stevenson there, the throw just in the dirt to second. One and one on one of the newest Indians this year. Veteran Mike Napoli, there's a breaking ball low. Well, you take a look at Napoli, and if you only scout by body type, you don't want to pitch him inside. I mean, he's a big, strong guy. He's got short arms. Those guys are very difficult to get inside on. So you start working that outside corner. Now, believe have been around a while, broke in with Anaheim back in 2006, was there for five years, couple of years in Texas, three in Boston, again in Texas, and again in Boston, finished up last year with the Rangers. Won a World Series with Texas back in, or played in a World Series back in Texas in 2011. Looked like he made his mind up. He was hacking at that 3-1 fastball no matter where it was. Three and two, runner at second base, two outs. And a tapper down to third. Should end the inning, and Suarez throws out Napoli, and that's that. So pretty impressive for Robert Stevenson in his 2016 spring debut. Reds bat when we return. Taking on the competition? You know, I can call this fight for you.
a guy that knows a little bit about pitching from the batter's box. That would be Barry Larkin sitting to the right of Homer Bailey. Good to see those guys chatting. Get our first look at Billy Hamilton getting a start today. He'll be the designated hitter, as he told Jim Day, if you happen to be with us yesterday. Billy coming back from the shoulder surgery, so they're not going to play him in the field quite yet. We did touch upon it briefly yesterday, and Billy was the first one to say, yeah, there's no doubt about it. What an important year this is for him. In their strike, each of the last two years has been ordained as the Reds' opening day center fielder and leadoff batter. And neither year from a batting average standpoint or more importantly for Billy Hamilton, an on-base percentage standpoint, has not gone the way everyone hoped. He's hoping to change that this year because what a devastating weapon, game-changing weapon he is once he gets on base. And really it boils down for Billy Hamilton to do two things. One is to keep the ball out of the air, and the other is to put it in play. And the more he chases pitches up in the zone, the more he's going to pop it up, and also the more he's going to strike out. Which he does to lead off the Reds' first inning. That's out number one. Here's the way the Reds stack up today in game two after beating the Indians by a run yesterday. Jose Peraza coming up, then Eugenio Suarez. Brandon Allen has started first. Jorman Rodriguez in right. Scott Shevler hit a home run, made a great catch in left field. He'll be in center today. A latter third of Winker, Colton Dahl, and Ramon Cabrera. Peraza fouls it out of play. Originally an Atlanta Brave was Jose Peraza. He's traded to the Dodgers and then part of that three-team deal which sent Todd Frazier to the White Sox coming to the Reds. He won't turn 22 until the end of April. Threw that fastball right by him, did Cody Anderson. In five minor league seasons, Peraza, a 3.02 batter with an on-base percentage of over 3.40. Saw his numbers from last year. Got a little bit of time in the big leagues with Los Angeles. Foul ground, Napoli. Nice play over near the stands for the second out of the inning. We talked about the starter yesterday for the Indians. When both were called up to the big leagues, Anderson pitched brilliantly and especially in September when it looked like the Indians were dead and they made a very late run at trying to get that second wild card and Anderson helped try and get them there. Well, Anderson is a guy that's come up through their organization, 14th round draft pick in 2011 and a big power arm, 6 feet 4 inches tall. He throws anywhere from 92 to 96 miles an hour. He's shown a really good fastball here so far this afternoon. Suarez very good at the plate yesterday. A couple of doubles caught that one off the end of the bat. And a fly ball into center field will be handled by Grossman. And a 1 2 3 inning for Anderson. We played one, and we are scoreless in Goodyear, Arizona. If you or a loved one are a victim of a surgical or anesthesia mistake, brain injury or paralysis, birth injury, late diagnosis, or
visited with Robert Stevenson about his four-seam fastball. So first is obviously a four-seam fastball. I throw it like that just across the seams, and I like to keep my fingers close together instead of spread apart. I feel like I have a little bit more control. I'm just used to throwing like that. And I've also heard over the years that this makes it a little bit, a little bit more velocity as opposed to spreading it apart. Um, and what I try to do is just when I release the ball, I try to make sure I keep my fingers on top. If I get on the side of it like that, then I'm going to be out on the right side of the plate. Very articulate young man. Good thing he didn't get that thing any closer to your nose. There's a fly ball into straightaway center field on the first pitch in the inning to Jesus Aguilar, and that's one pitch and one out for Stevenson here in the second inning. He scored he was a to work with, and really has a good understanding for a guy that I remember talking to Robert his first year. He came to uh, minor league spring training, and you know, bright eyed, green behind the ears, just really. All he was was a hard thrower and didn't understand really much about the art of pitching at all. And I, I'm just really happy to see how far he has come from a mental standpoint as to what it takes to get to the major leagues. That arm has always been there. Reds drafted him when he was committed to go and pitch for the University of Washington. And you may say, well, why would a kid who grows up just north of San Francisco be interested in going to the University of Washington with all the good college programs in the state of California? Well, he had worked with one of the assistant coaches from the University of Washington for many years as, a, as an adolescent, and they kind of had an inside track there. There's a young man, Colin Cowgill, who is in the Indians organization for the first time was actually born in Cincinnati but he grew up in Lexington Kentucky went to Henry Clay High School down there and he's out of there on strike second strikeout for Stevenson he's retired five of the first six that he has faced the only Cleveland base runner was a two-out walk uh, the two strikeouts that Robert Stevenson has recorded today one on a changeup one on that power curveball Grossman, left-handed batting center fielder, looks at ball one low. Indians a year ago, one game over 500. All three years that Terry Francona has managed his franchise, they've had a better record better than the break-even mark. First time an Indians franchise has put together three of those consecutively. Since 99, 2000, and 2001. Stung down the right field line. It will fall all the way to the wall. Grossman on his way to second, and he will motor it to third with a two out stand up triple. Now uh, you throw it right down Broadway looking for a fastball. That's a nice short stroke that Grossman puts on it. Is that the third triple we have seen here in two days? Mm -hmm. well, they spring training ballparks, especially the big one like here in Goodyear. They'll give up more triples than you'll see in two weeks or maybe even a month back at Great American Ballpark. Roberto Perez about it. And a tapper. Nice pickup by Suarez. A shortstop turn third baseman. That is a nifty play right there by Eugenio to end the inning. Two scoreless innings for Robert Stevenson here at Goodyear. Love these things. Hilarious.
pleasure to welcome in Reds pitcher Anthony DiSclefani. Could you have imagined this time last year you were just looking to establish yourself. You're pitching tomorrow, which would line you up if all goes well to be the opening day starter. Could you have imagined what's happened to you over the last year? No, um, you know, it's crazy. You know, last year I'm fighting for, you know, fifth spot in rotation. And, you know, this year you know, I have a chance to go to, you know, opening day as long as everything, you know, goes well, which, you know, I want to earn that, so. You've seen it for yourself how special opening day is in Cincinnati, and I imagine that if you get that honor, uh, it would be a big one for you. Yeah, that would be something I can remember for a long time. You know, I was part of the parade last year with uh, Iglesias, and, you know, just to see how passionate the fans are there in Cincinnati is awesome, and it would be a huge honor to throw open that. You certainly opened eyes uh, last year, and the players love playing behind you, but you're still a young pitcher. What are you working on still? Uh, just consistency. I want to go out there, you know, this spring and, you know, you know, just feel good about, you know, my delivery and, you know, having a plan through camp and then going into the season. I've talked to Mezzarocco quite a bunch and, and as long with uh, Tucker and just want to be able to execute a plan through spring and carry it into the season. I imagine the pitchers as a whole uh, are motivated to have a good year because people counting you out. Would uh, you be in that category? <laughs> Man, you know, I think... I think that, you know, as a whole, as a team, you know, we're real young. We got a lot of talent. And, you know, I think we're going to surprise some people this year. I don't want to, I'm not going to count us out. Well, we like to hear that. Good luck tomorrow. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Appreciate that. Let's go back upstairs. That's Anthony East Clifani. All right, James Day, thank you very much. One out, Brandon Allen, a tapper to the right side to lead off the inning in this scoreless game. Bottom of the second inning, and the batter is Jorman Rodriguez. You know, it seems like Anthony DiScofani has the same temperament, whether you're interviewing him on the air or whether he's on the mound. I mean, he's this guy with a very stoic approach, a poker face on the mound, and uh, you know, he might be bubbling inside with excitement about possibly pitching that opening day assignment, but you'd never read it on him. He pitched some mighty good games for the Cincinnati Reds team last year. Now they're depending on him to pitch a number of those again this year. Yes, they are. But you would have never known. I, I think that's what made that rookie year, Chris, precisely what you alluded to so impressive is that there were games that didn't go his way. And he wasn't standing out there and pouting and walking around the mound and hanging his head, nor was he sticking his chest out and strutting around the mound when he'd be pitching a really good game. He's only 25 years old. Won nine games last year and pitched 184 innings. That turned out after the trades of Cueto and Leak to be the most innings pitched on the Reds team last year. So here's Scott Shubler. Came over in the Todd Frazier deal from the Dodgers. It's a reputation of having a powerful stroke. That's a powerful line drive. But right at the center fielder Grossman, six up, six down through two innings today for Cody Anderson. And now we get a look at Cody Reed, highly touted left-handed. He's on the mound next.
Ball is live with the MLB.com at bat app. Stay connected all spring. Radio broadcast, video highlights, stats, news, and so much more. Just download MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball on your smartphone or tablet. Good year, ballpark. Good year, Arizona. Robert Stevenson is a number one ranked prospect in the Cincinnati Reds organization, but right on his heels is this young man. Left-hander came over from Kansas City, one of three left-handers in that deal for Johnny Cueto. Cody Reed, look at those numbers in his eight starts after the trade. Well, in his first start, or at least within a week of coming over from the Kansas City Royals organization, he set a career-high 12 strikeouts in a game that he pitched for Double-A Pensacola. So welcome to the organization, Cody Reed. All of a sudden now, he's the number two pitching prospect in the organization. Throws really hard, anywhere from 92 to the high 90s. And you're going to see really an unusual arm slot for Reed. He reminds me a little bit of Madison Bumgarner. But what I guess the difference, though, for a lot of guys who throw with a low arm slot, he has really good direction to the plate. If you look at his right leg as he strides towards home plate, great angle where we have right now, you'll see that he's right on line. Tapper back to the mound. Off the bat of Ramsey, and Cody will throw him out. Cody, 22 years young, grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, still makes his home down in the Memphis area. Well, the motion that we talk about with Cody Reed, he stays in control right there. He's got a high leg lift, and it looks a little bit of a higher arm angle right there. But when you stand in the batter's box, he's kind of a low three quarters, but that ball has a lot of late life to it. That and a sweeping slider. I mean, if he's only a two pitch pitcher, you may be able to get away with those two pitches, even at the big league level. The changeup is right now a work in progress. Reed originally was a second-round draft choice by Kansas City out of Northwest Mississippi Community College in 2013. His first full year in the minor leagues in 2014, pitching down in Lexington, Kentucky, he did not have a good year at all. In fact, it was a disaster. Had an ERA of three and a, five and a half, a record of three and nine on the year, walked a lot of batters. But then last year, it finally came all together a combined with kansas city's organization and the reds a 13 and 9 record an overall season era at 2.41 that may be big tall left-handers take a little longer Well, Randy Johnson certainly would fit that bill, taking a little longer, although the name you brought up earlier, it didn't take Mr. Bumgarner long at all. And if I remember right, wasn't he out of high school in North Carolina, Madison Bumgarner? You're right, he was. In fact, Cody Reed not even drafted out of high school. was under the radar his high school year. Even when he went to junior college the first year, he was under the radar so much he was never drafted. Then all of a sudden, number two pick, now number two prospect. And now, one, two, three inning. Pitching for the first time is a Cincinnati Red.
0.8 for Milwaukee. I'm Jim Day back in the dugout. My pleasure to welcome in Joey Votto. Early on uh, when camp opened, you went on record as saying you're excited about the process that the Reds are going through right now. Uh, now that you've been here and you've seen this uh, group of young, talented players, are you even more excited? Um, yeah, yeah. I haven't really been paying much attention to them. I think that's uh, it's always a player's responsibility to grab people's attention. So uh, we'll see. I hope they do. All, they all do well. You've never been a rah-rah guy, uh, but you're one of the best lead-by-examples guys I've ever seen in the game. In your own way, is there a way that you can help out young players? <laughs> Jim Day's experience. <laughs> I am one of the better lead-by-example guys. You are. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, from my from my experience, the the guys that uh, that I played next to, Alex Gonzalez. Um, you know, I played behind Scott Scott Hatterberg. I played a little bit with Jeff Conine. I watched a guy like David Weathers compete, and these are guys that uh, most fans uh, forgotten about or would at least remember by name. But uh, those are the sort of guys that uh, that I admired and respect because of the way they competed and performed on a daily basis, played through injuries, played through personal things, and that's the sort of thing that uh, impacted me, and I'd like, to feel, I'd like to be able to do the same thing. Are you a guy that sets personal goals before the season? You know, a big goal of mine is to do as few interviews as possible. I can both, tell. Both on TV, <laughs> uh, newspaper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, usually before the season, health is my number one priority. Um, I think about what I can do to stay on the field as long as possible, as often as possible. And and then from there, I would like to think that uh, this wonderful, humbling game will put me in my place, and then I kind of push back from there and turn into a bit of a head case and then hopefully do my very best. And this wonderful, humbling interview process as well. I don't feel <laughs> humble doing an interview. No, I do. I feel very <laughs> confident doing an interview with you. So I hope you feel the same way. I do. And we always appreciate your time. Lots of luck the rest of the way. That's it? Oh, you want more? Okay, let's let's talk more. Yeah, let's... Uh, let's uh, what would you like to talk about? No, nothing. I mean, I was I was expecting something a little bit more in depth, depth maybe something a bit more personal. Uh, you know, maybe get me to cry on camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> well, let's see how I could get Joey Votter to cry. That would be a career achievement right there. You'd like that, huh? You like cr making would, people cry? No, no, no. Not at all, <laughs> I, I, actually. Um, but uh, I don't know. How, how's the dog? How's Maris? It's good. He's probably pretty upset at me right now. He's waiting at home. Um, Brian Price was nice enough to make sure that I came out here and watched five innings today instead of go home and chill. <laughs> so I'd like to thank my manager for that. But uh, the inning's over. Got to go. <laughs> See you. All right, Joey, thank you. Always an interesting process. We're back after this.
End of three pitching dominated ball game so far and very impressive fashion, especially for the Reds. Robert Stevenson, the front two innings, allowed one hit, no run, struck out two, walked a batter. And now we get a look at our second inning from the number two ranked prospect behind Stevenson in the Reds organization, left hander Cody Reed. And certainly no one more excited about what's happening so far, whether it be spring training or not. Then the man who's now the senior vice president in his first year as general manager of the Reds, Dick Williams. Pretty good stuff, huh? Hey, thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming it's, up. It's good to start watching games, isn't it? Well, I mean, you know, you're kind of like a player rehabbing from an injury. You, you know, you blow an ACL right before the start of spring training, yet here you are, no brace, no crutches, or you're okay. And what a testament to the uh, medical team that we yeah. have at the Reds. I just wanted to stress test them. But uh, now I know why our player contracts prohibit snow skiing. There's yeah. a good reason for that, boys. <laughs> Big winner for you, Dick. I mean, uh, name the general manager in the offseason. Uh, that kind of came out of nowhere, didn't it? Well, I don't know about nowhere. I, I certainly wasn't expecting it, but I think Bob and Walt had been thinking about it for a little while and felt comfortable that now was the right time to begin the transition. And I, I'm really glad we did it because it, it allows us to, to continue to get a, a jump start on what we started last offseason, trading away some of these guys and reloading the, the talent pipeline, getting ready for the next couple years, just like we did leading up to the 2010 to 13 run. You know, there were a few years there where we were trying to fill the system with talent, um, and we're going we're gonna to do it again. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, we started that transition. And I'm glad Bob had the foresight to allow Walt and I to work together this year so that um, I, can, I, you know, I can lean on him, sort of share the workload this year, and it'll, it'll have me better prepared for uh, when, it's, when it's time next season. Well, for those that don't know, I mean, you're in your 11th year, I believe it is now, in the organization, and you've done a little bit of everything inside the baseball operations department leading up and preparing yourself for this day and for this time and for this job and this title, including helping uh, put together this whole facility here in Goodyear, Arizona. When you come here today, and yesterday was your first game as general manager of the Reds, spring training albeit, but Stevenson and Reed back-to-back back has got to be a pretty exciting day. Oh, big time. And then, you know, just look, look down in that dugout, and you see a lot of faces. Those two guys are getting a lot of attention right now. But as I said to someone the other day, once spring training starts, you know, nobody down in that dugout knows your prospect ranking. So they're all on equal footing. Um, but we got a, a glimpse of some exciting position players yesterday and uh, you know each each day this week it's like opening another Christmas present you kind of get to see a new guy out there in a red uniform between the lines uh, for the first time without breaking down the entire you know relationship and kind of like you know Walt's still the president you're the senior vice president you're the GM and all that kind of thing but for setting the criteria or the design or how you want a spring training to go you know what are some of the things you're you're saying to yourself right now you're meeting every day or are you doing it every other day what are some of the things you're doing sort of behind the scenes at this point in your first few weeks on the job in spring training well i think what i've seen this spring that's that's been a little different is with the amount of young guys we have in camp and not only do you have a lot of young guys, you have young, versatile players, athletic players that, that can fill different roles for us. The line of communication between the general manager's office, and I'll call that, you know, that's, that's Walt, myself, that's Kevin Towers, that's Sam and Nick, it's, it's a group of us. And the coaching staff, that line of communication is more critical than ever. Um, because spring training is an opportunity to see these guys in multiple positions. We can really have some fun with the lineups. We can have some fun with the defensive positioning and, and see how we can use these guys in spring training. And that's a lot different from 10 and 11 and 12 when, you know, you were watching Joey and Brandon and Zach and Todd get their work in for half a game. And then we bring in some guys that had no chance of making the team. So how, how we maximize these opportunities, these at-bats, is a little more important this year. Dick, we asked Walt Jockety yesterday when we had him up here, and we've asked a lot of people surrounding this ball club, you know, about their expectations, win-loss-wise, uh, what you're looking for in 2016. What, how do you feel about it? Well, we're undefeated so far, and I plan to keep it that way, Chris. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So are um, playoff tickets available yet? You know, what What I've said is we're on, we're on the road to championship baseball. You know, that's where we're headed. Um, we've got a bunch of players that are part of winning teams in the past, and a, a bunch of guys are going to be a part of the 
winning teams in the future for us. It's, it's kind of hard to watch the action and, and talk at the it same is. time. I, I appreciate your, <laughs> what you guys have to do, because when we're over there, we're just watching the action and we're muttering under our breath, but to keep talking while we're watching. Um, but, uh, um, you know, th there's it's no secret that people are uh, picking us to, you know, finish at the bottom of the division. That's that's all also a testament to what some of the other teams in the division have going. you got three teams coming off 97-plus wins. They all added a lot in free agency this year. They're at the peak of their cycle. They're where we were in 10, 11, 12, 13, and that's where we're going to get back to. Um, and so we just have to be patient with these guys. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have our challenges this year, but it's going to be developing. It's going to be exciting, and I think we're going to outperform what people are expecting. Well, as a follow-up to that, Dick, in the last few years, it seemed that the Reds have been conservative in advancing players along through the minor leagues. You want to get them, you know, experience at this level before they go to the next level and so on. Would you be more aggressive this year because it is a rebuilding year? Would you be more likely to, to bring a guy to the major leagues uh, with little or no experience, say, in AAA? or um, maybe you'd like to see a guy down for the minor leagues for a few more months, but hey, since we're rebuilding, we're going to bring him up. I mean, a great example would be Robert Stevens and and or Cody Reed. These guys will tell you what, what they're ready for and what their workload's ready for. I can tell you we will not negatively impact a player's development just uh, to improve the big league team in the short term. You know, it's more important for us to maximize the value of each and every player. Look, we jumped Mike Leake straight to the big leagues. Uh, last year we went with, I think it was over 100 starts by rookie pitchers, 64 in a row. So we're not afraid to push young guys to the big league level. But if we have a hole, um, we're not going to take a player like Cody or Robert and put them in there if they're not ready. You know, it's more important that we develop each of these guys on their own timeline. I think the next 30 days will give us a pretty good sense of where, the, where these guys are. Um, but... Uh, but everybody, everybody sort of matures at a, at a different pace. And um, so we'll, we'll lean pretty heavily on the coaching staff and their opinions. Um, but there is opportunity to be had for the young guys, to be sure. I'm kind of curious, Dick, is the greater challenge with all these young pitchers, and we'll just focus on them for a minute, is the greater challenge over the next 30 days leading up to opening day there's a ball back up through the middle, knocked down, but the runner is safe at first. It'll bring in a second run. Peraza just about a half step late getting there, and it's 2 0 Cleveland. Is the greater challenge over the next 30 days to figure out of these young pitchers who's ready for the big leagues, or is the greater challenge what role on a major league team they might have? Yeah, that's a great question um, because there's different schools of thought. And uh, I think for, for me personally, it's determining where the maximum ceiling is and what the right role is to, to help that player reach the maximum ceiling as opposed to, you know, are they ready to get to the big leagues quicker? Because there's no, you know, there's, there's no secret that sometimes you can rush these guys a little bit if they play a more limited role. Um, you know, we've, we've done that in the past. We've taken guys that could fit both roles. And, you know, at the time when we were looking at uh, a team that was going to contend in the postseason, you take a guy like Chapman and you make the decision to, to put him in a, in a closer role because that's what the team needed at the time. But, you know, did, did he ultimately achieve less of his ceiling? You know, I don't know that we'll ever know. Um, but that, that's not the course of action we'd take this year just given where, you know, where we project to finish. Peraza to the glove side, and that'll end the inning. Um, Dick Williams will stick around for another half inning, if you don't mind. Sure. Cleveland gets a pair off Cody Reed and leads by that count 2 nothing. Banking success.
Here it comes, and he struck him out swinging. And the 1990 National League Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. All right, now, while most of you are watching the celebration the and the players and Lou Pinella, Dick Williams' mom and dad were and looking for him on the field. Where is he? Is that you in the beige sport coat or jacket there on the left? I'm wearing a, a, a brown kind of raincoat. It was cold. Yeah, it was what? October. I was home from college uh, for, a, for a long weekend. Got, got, got to watch this game, and I got so excited when we won. I jumped on the field. I thought the whole city of Cincinnati was going with me. It turned out <laughs> I was uh, one of only about nine people to make it to the mound. <laughs> but you didn't spend a night in jail or anything, so you were okay. I, I did get handcuffs. I ended up getting a citation. For Come on, you really got handcuffed? I, I did. I did. Um, and I was led over to a little group of people, and we got to watch the rest of the celebration from right there on the field, which was kind of worth it. Um, <laughs> most of those people were older than me and had had a lot of, to drink. I was not yet 21. Right. So they ended up going to uh, spend a night in jail. I was released. I got a little misdemeanor trespassing. Okay. Yeah. Well, was it worth it? Oh, 100%. There's nothing better <laughs> than that feeling. And when people ask me about working for the Reds now, I just, you know, I, I try to describe. I'm glad somebody found that video. I've never seen it. Um, but I tried to describe the feeling I had of jumping on the That's field. That's the first time you've ever seen that? I, I have a, um, the Enquirer the next day had a picture, and I'm in a still shot. And I have that framed with my uh, ticket that I got, my game ticket and my ticket for getting arrested. Uh, they hang in my office. No striped suit or anything like that, or Sheriff Joe having you think or anything out here. <laughs> I want to run. I, I want to run back on the field like that with a team someday and not get arrested. Hey, so that's that. my goal in the next few years. So, so we've got a GM with a rap sheet. <laughs> I think my my community service wiped it. That's off. right. All right. Well, that's right. And now here he is. Who would have ever thunk it? Handcuffs on the field in 1990, and now trying to get this organization rolling here in 2016. You know, Dick, there's been a general feeling uh, uh, that this ball club has not used some of the newer metrics and sabermetric analysis and so on that other ball clubs have had uh, in the last few years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of books out about, for instance, the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, using defensive metrics to, to shift more often than ever before. And there's more and more data points available to ball clubs or not. Is that true or not? Are the Reds behind the bell curve in, in getting with the, the analytics part of baseball? No, we're not. Not at all, Chris. I'm glad you asked. You know, it's, it's not something everybody talks a lot about. And sometimes perception becomes reality. And some of these teams that are in bigger markets have... Uh, you know, journalists that like to say nice things about them and curry favor with the teams. And next thing you know, these guys are geniuses with all the uh, black boxes that no other team has access to. And I can just tell you, when I got to the Reds, um, they were already um, working behind the scenes. They were one of the first teams to sort of enable the technology that enabled uh, the player development and scouting staffs to file their reports electronically and get them back to the home office. And that doesn't sound like a big deal now, but when we started, it was that a, that a guy could file his written reports at the hotel at night and get it transmitted electronically back to the office. Since then, we've we've only grown the department, and um, uh, you know, under my direction, we we hired Sam Grossman back in 2007, and from there, we we kind of created a uh, analytics department where we we began to develop our own in-house technology, our own software program and then hired analysts to begin analyzing the data we were compiling. Just this offseason, we added three more people. Um, we even uh, hired Charles Ledden, who was a trainer and organization, to head a sports science department up for us. So we're doing research and development in that area. And this is just such an exciting uh, time to be involved in baseball. I mean, you guys have followed it for a long time. Have you ever seen such an inflection point in terms of data becoming available to the teams well, it's like an arms race to figure out what to do with it it is but i guess it all comes back still to the same balance of how do you balance out the old time scouts observation and what the numbers are telling you well you, you've gotten to know our guys a little bit you, you've been around them you've seen them on the road i mean right now my you know a lot of my analytics guys are here in the park they're sitting down there next to a scout they're watching a game um, they've, they've been writing reports so that when we roll out new technology to these scouts, these guys understand how it impacts that you know, scout's daily life. By the same token, you know, our scouts are asking questions of our analytics guys, and I really like to see that 
that symbiotic relationship because um, you know both can benefit from the other's perspective and and we still I can give you examples as recent as last year where we were claiming guys from other teams based on scouting reports and not statistics and vice versa going with the stats over the over the reports well I know that uh, being a native Cincinnati and no one is going to work harder uh, put in more hours more time, more dedication, more blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak, of, of getting this franchise back to where uh, all of us would love to see it uh, to be again one day. And, uh, Dick, I know everybody around here is rooting like heck and, and rooting like crazy for you to do well. We're wishing you all the best. I, I really appreciate it, guys. I couldn't be prouder to have this role. And uh, it's going to be a real team effort. But I think we're in for some really fun, exciting stuff uh, the next couple of years. And, um, the, the way that the fan base has embraced uh, what we've said this offseason and what we've started to do has been really encouraging. And we just all have to stay committed and patient. And, and we know good things are going to happen. Thanks for coming up, my man. Thank you, Dick. Thanks, guys. Great having Dick Williams with us here in the booth with two outs in the inning. I'm, uh, of course, telling him goodbye as uh, Eugenio Suarez rips one down the third baseline. I think Suarez had a lot of good days coming, too. I'll tell you, he's got a nice level swing. The, the two swings he had yesterday, driving the ball to right center field hard, and that one right inside the bag of third base. Uh, I really like that deal the Reds made uh, with the Detroit Tigers to get Suarez over here. Mm -hmm. It was Alfredo Simon that went the other way, if you remember. And then a base hit into center field by Brandon Allen, and the Reds are on the board. So it is a two-to-one ball game. Allen on his way to second, slides in safely. The Indians with a pair in the top of the inning. The Reds get one back in the bottom half. But against the new pitcher, Jeff Manship. Brandon Allen, the guy that just got that base hit, is one of those players that you can kind of easily overlook. He's been around a little bit. He's even played in Japan. But he has always had a reputation to being a hard-hitting player. Of course, the Reds have him playing at first base today, which is currently occupied. Well, it might not be, you know, the old character uh, Crash Davis kind of numbers, but, you know, Allen has had that kind of yeah. minor league mm -hmm. career. He's closing in on 200 career minor league home runs and nearly 800 minor league runs batted in. He has over 250 minor league doubles. Those are big time numbers. Yeah. So he can hit. Really never been given much of a chance at all in the major leagues. Time with Arizona, Oakland, Tampa Bay. Never more than 146 at bats, but an RBI in this inning to get the Reds on the board. We're going to look at Jumbo Diaz when we come back. Reds are trailing 2-1 to one at the end of four.
Be a part of the action this year. The Reds picked six plan, guarantee an exclusive Joey Votto 30-inch Louisville Slugger, and pick any six regular season home games, including that big Hall of Fame weekend. Plus, receive six free McDonald's extra value meals. Purchase a Reds pick six plan, save up to 25%. By visiting reds.com slash pick six. Some restrictions may apply. That little man out there in the lawn area. Big day for him. He's got a good seat out there. I don't know, don't know if there's a bad seat out there on that You're grassy right. berm. Big fella, Jumbo Diaz. Well, you mean big fella. Yes. And it's, you know, we've talked so much about young pitchers and young players so far in our broadcast time that we really left out, you know, some of the guys that the Reds are depending on to come back and pitch good baseball like they did last year. 60 innings, over 70 strikeouts last season for Jumbo Diaz. Figures to be somewhere in the back of the Reds' bullpen, which is yet undetermined who will be the closer and who will be the setup man or it could be that brian price decides to go with more of a bullpen by committee type of arrangement if it if it leads to that sounded like a broken bat roller peraza to his right and will throw out ramsey to begin the cleveland fifth inning the tribe with a one-run lead two one game he's smooth out there peraza mm -hmm. I mean, he, the calling card that he comes with, the main scouting report on Peraza is his speed and his defense. And, of course, when you play defense like he does, versatility is important. They like to see him play a little second base, but, again, that's the spot occupied right now by Brandon Phillips. Well, you know the story on Jumbo. He was a great story, in fact, going back to 2014 when in nearly 40 games pitched very well for the Reds an ERA at 3.3 34 innings struck out 37 he became a very important part of that bullpen in short order that is going to roll foul last year the Reds were really counting on him down there in that bullpen as their seventh inning right-hander and after a good start he fell into a terrible way so bad that they sent him back to the minor leagues. Went down to Louisville, threw brilliantly, and when the Reds brought him back, Chris, he looked like the Jumbo from the year before. Well, for Jumbo, I think a lot of it is confidence. Remember that this is a pitcher that spent, that did not make it to the major leagues until he was 30 years old. I mean, he was around one organization after another. He His weight ballooned way over 300 pounds, and finally, when he did come to the Reds after an offseason of really committing to try to get his weight down and a commitment to baseball, you know, it paid off. Deep into right field, and that one is over the wall. Off the bat of Jose Ramirez, and the Indians get that Reds run right back to make it a 3-1 to -one game. I didn't think he hit it that well, really, but the ball out here just carries and carries. No wind to speak of today, but thin air and a high fastball. Bye-bye. Ramirez just turned 23 years young. He's worked his way up the ladder since being signed as a teenager out of the Dominican Republic. He's put up some very good numbers in the minor leagues. Been up and down each of the last three years and hasn't done it at the big league level yet. Doesn't mean that he won't. Now Lindoy takes that one low and in. Two balls and a strike. He has struck out twice. Once against Robert Stevenson. A second time against Cody Reed.
You know, Tom, you look around the, the complex, whether it's the spring training complex where the Reds practice or here where they play at the big stadium on game day. There's so many Reds employees that have made their way out here to Goodyear. You'd think that everybody's out here, but they're not. Those that are left behind are right now in the Champions Club watching the game on TV. Really? So we send our best to each and every one of them. Thanks for tuning in. Well, it got a little chilly again in Cincinnati. We had a beautiful weekend this past weekend. I mean, just beautiful. In fact, the last two weekends have just been off the charts. But temperatures, although a lot of sunshine today, we understand. Uh, pretty chilly back there. We hope everybody's doing all right. Be right back in your shoes tomorrow. Chilly. As will you. It'll be warming up for you when you get home next week, though. Now that your basketball season is over, your actual, your championship basketball season, congratulations. Thank you. On we had a good time. Guiding Luke's team right down the line to the championship. We had a lot of fun. Had a lot of fun. They do a great job running that whole league all over town. Ben Goodyear, the fellow who runs that entire operation, and... Uh, Hey, you savor every moment. Uh, you know it. Uh, you know, you still have one left at home. Uh, ours are still pretty young, but man, you know, whether you're winning or losing, getting out there and having a chance to partake in anything with your kids and being right there with them, those days don't last forever, and you cherish each and every one of them. Well, I take it as a, the head coach, you were the fine example of calmness from no. the very first game no. to the end of the season. No. I think if you were to go around Madeira, you might get a very different impression. There's <laughs> and I will go around Madeira. And I know you will. There's a double play which will end the inning. You had to bring it up. You had to bring it up. You had to bring it up. Thank you. 3 1 ball game, Indians in front. This is going to be awesome. This is this could be a great thing for you. So, uh, yeah, I'm just excited to be here and to get things going. Obviously, it's the greatest thing about coming over here is right away I could potentially be be there in opening day. At the end of the day, I got to go out and play right now and play well. So that's all I'm concentrating on. And what a way to make a debut and to open some eyes for Scott Shebler. Came over from the Dodgers, hit a home run yesterday, driving the ball into left center field, and really that's his mo. Tremendous power. And then, Chris, how about this play? Game-saving catch. Bases loaded and two outs. He goes right up against the wall. In fact, the batter didn't even know if he caught it or not. He went up over to grab that. Banged right into the support beam between the two fence areas. But what an excellent. And I've got to ask the question again. I mean, can you make the team on the first day of spring training? Because if anybody's put a, an effort that would 
give it that kind of credence. The one that he did yesterday certainly is in that category. Mm -hmm. Man. Well, a familiar name now, 30 years old. It's amazing how time does fly. Back in 2006, Jabba Chamberlain was the number one draft pick of the New York Yankees. In 2007, he went single A, double A, triple A, and pitched in 19 games for the Major League Club, including the playoffs, when ironically enough, the Yankees played the Cleveland Indians in that opening round in the division series. And you know, it's interesting, uh, Chris, uh, remember almost like it was yesterday, there was all the debate, should he be a starter, should he be a reliever? And the Yankees really kept... I'm not going to use the word uh, waffling, but they certainly kept, you know, a little bit of this. Uh, they'd relieve him, then they'd start him, and then they'd relieve him, and they'd start him for a little while. Caused some arm problems. He's never been the same guy. He's bounced around a little bit the last number of years from the Yankees, Detroit, up and down from the minor leagues, Kansas City for a short while last year, and Cleveland hoping they can get him back to the old Java Chamber. Still got some giddy up on that fastball. Well, there's something to be said for contending teams. It seems like teams that expect to contend, and the Indians are in that category, obviously, this year, that they like to fill out their roster with some experience in pitchers in middle relief. And that's one reason why they're taking a shot at Chamberlain this year. over Shevler to begin the fifth inning. One out. Now looking fastball, getting breaking ball, and that'll get you just about every time, especially at that spot. You know, right-handed pitchers that throw that breaking ball want to land that pitch on the back foot of a left-handed hitter, and that showed you exactly where that ball was headed to Scott Shevler. Jesse Winker, 22-year-old outfielder, takes a fastball, a strike on the outside corner. Supplemental first-round pick, 49th overall. In June of 2012, Jesse Winker. Grew up in Orlando, Florida. We talked about Robert Stevenson being the overall number one prospect as rated by Baseball America. Winker is the Reds' number one position player prospect by Baseball America. Fifth overall. Brian Price was quoted very early in spring training as saying, look, there are guys that have played at higher levels than Jeff, Jesse Winker. Winker, in fact, has never played at AAA. Not one game. He went from rookie ball, two stops of single A in Dayton and Bakersfield, finished 14 in Pensacola, played all of last year in Pensacola, had the terrible start, came on strong at the end of the year. But Brian said, I'm not going to rule him out as having a chance to be the left fielder on opening day for the Reds this year. Well, let's face it, though. Had the Reds been able to complete a trade for Jay Bruce, or if they are able to complete a trade for Jay Bruce between now and opening day, would give Winker a lot better chance of making this ball club and be a guy who would even be sticking out in the right field. So right now, there's a log jam of players all competing for the left field spot. And I'm not sure what the, the pecking order is right now. A lot of that is determined by their play in spring training. So, you know, you might want to ask Brian 30 days from now where everything plays out because oftentimes players will play their way out. Tough luck hitting today for Winker. He has hit two rockets, but both loud outs. One to right and now one to center. Two away in the inning. Reds down three to one in the bottom of the fifth inning.
Calton Dahl drops one down the right field line and caught in short right field by Calgill in a 1-2-3 inning for Chamberlain. You've got some interesting dynamics in this game. You've got some key injured players that you need to ease back, a group of young players you want to give a fair shot to, an even bigger group of young pitchers you need to get mound time for, and the veterans that we're used to. How are those dynamics working out? And I imagine you've got to be excited about the whole process. Yeah, well, we're in our second game, so we're, we're seeing it, unf it unfold at the moment. Um, it's great. You know, it's, it's, it's fun to see these kids. A lot of them we're not that familiar with because they're coming from other organizations. Certainly saw them on video and had our scouting reports, but seeing them firsthand is nice as well as that kind of that next crop of young players that have come through the system. It was nice to see Robert Stevenson on the mound, see Shevler out in center field. Yeah. We had him out in left the other day or yesterday. So it, it's just kind of fun to see these guys, seeing Suarez over at third base after playing all year at shortstop last year. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Real quick, your impressions on Stevenson and Reed today. Uh, you're both good. You know, I always like to get the first one under everybody's yeah. belt here. It doesn't matter if you're a rookie or a veteran. Uh, let them kind of get the, the feel for being back in competition again and really start to assess more in the second outing. But they both challenge hitters. They're both, both locked in, focused. Um, obviously really good stuff. And now it's just trying to fine-tune things with Robert. It's commanding his stuff a little bit better. Cody Reed, I mean, he's a pretty polished young guy. I think he's going to move quickly. Appreciate your time, Brian. You got it, Jim. Thanks. Let's go back upstairs. Tom and Chris. All righty, Jim, thank you very much. And Brian Price, thank you very much. Hopefully we can hear from the manager again before spring training is over. We have two more games right here on Fox Sports Ohio for you coming up in the month of March, the 15th, and then again on the 25th. Well, it'll be very interesting to see where we are and who's still hanging around battling for spots come that final game. We're on the tube on the 25th. Ryan Matthews, a good comeback story last year, Mr. Welsh. Well, he was in 57 games for the Reds last year, Ryan Matthews was. 55 innings overall and kind of an innings eater out of the bullpen. And you wonder if that might be the same role that he has an opportunity to nail down this spring. I say that because sometimes ball clubs are reluctant to have young guys in middle relief roles that are out there in a lopsided loss where they're just giving it up and you got to take one for the team. If you do that with a young player who's on his way up, you can hurt his confidence. It may take a while for him to get back. Whereas a veteran player who knows that's just the way that goes, that's why you've got him on the ball club. Save your bullpen sometimes can make a difference between winning and losing the game the day after. Base hit by Napoli, his second hit today. 
Now Aguilar looks oh. to strike on the inside corner. He knocked in the first Cleveland run of the game with a double in the right center field, and they scored twice. Off Cody Reed in the fourth inning. Reds got a run, a double by Suarez, a single by Brandon Allen in the fourth. And then Jose Ramirez homered off Jumbo Diaz in the fifth, and that's where we are, 3-1 Cleveland. Foul ball. 0-2 on Aguilar. All right, a lot of changes for the Reds. Joe Hudson will take over now behind a plate. Lavallee over at first. A lot of guys you've never heard of. We'll try and tell you a little bit about each and every one of them. Former college star at Stanford. Alex Blandino now at second base. Pacheco at third. Lake Trahan now the shortstop. And here is strike three to Aguilar. One away in the inning. Now Ryan Matthews got fastball slider and changeup, a sinking fastball on the outside corner. I'm not so sure that Jesus Aguilar agreed with the call. Gill is swinging a foul tip into the mid of Hudson for strike one. down to third there's one and that's a double play to win the unit so quick work for Ryan Matthews we're on our way to the bottom of the six the Indians lead three to one you want to go that you've never been Italy something you can't travel without oh my phone window or aisle aisle New York or LA LA famous person you want to meet um, Michael Jordan go to karaoke song easy by Lionel Richie <laughs> Wow <laughs> Ooh, like that well that's Part of our show coming up later tonight on an all-new Reds Weekly. Jim Day will take a look at the options out in the left field and obviously help you get to know Reds catcher Tucker Barnhart. Jeff Pecoro, Doug Flynn will join Jim for Reds Weekly. And that is coming up after the game 
today and then stick around later tonight for Reds Roundtable with Dick Williams and Walt Jockety. <laughs> Indians leading three to one after five and a half. Joe Hudson, the catcher, batting for the first time against a new pitcher, Dan Otero. Java Chamberlain working a perfect fifth inning. You know, it's quite interesting. I know some of you at home caught it when we put up all the changes initially. Eight entirely new position players took over in the top of this inning for the Reds on defense. There's strike three called to Hudson, one away in the inning. One of those in the game right now is Juan Duran playing right field. He has been suspended for half of what would be a major league season. Yet he is allowed to play in spring training games. There was a question earlier today with Aroldis Chapman having been suspended by Major League Baseball yesterday for 30 games with their new domestic violence policy in MLB. Chapman is not allowed to play in games where they charge admission to a game. So he's allowed to pitch in B games over on backfields, that kind of thing. But Chapman not allowed to pitch in a game. Duran is allowed to play in games. So that answers one question. The other question is, are you taking at bats away from another player right now in spring training by playing Juan Duran in games. I mean, you're not going to bury the guy in your organization. You're hoping that he can learn from this and move on and move forward and still become a good player for you in the months and years ahead. But for right now, you know he won't play in the first two-plus months of the upcoming minor league season. I was actually surprised to see him dressing in Major League Camp in the Big League Clubhouse when mm -hmm. I came in, uh, not knowing the, you know, the, the fine words of, of the, the agreement that says he, what the suspension actually yep. is. So evidently there are two different types of uh, suspensions, one that is a role Chapman has and one that uh, Juan Duran is serving. Meanwhile, Jake Cave had a couple of hits yesterday, Chris, and now a double in the right center field. He's got a nice swing, Cave does. He stays back on the ball nicely. Hit that pitch a long way. Reds are very excited about Jake Cave. And here's another guy they're excited about, and that is Alex Blandino. down by the first baseman. They'll get the out. On to third goes Cave. Two away in the inning. Landino, a 23-year-old, grew up in Palo Alto, California. 29th overall pick in the June 2014 first-year player draft is ranked as the sixth best prospect in the Reds organization. They picked him out of Stanford University. Reds have a runner at third with two away, and now the batter is Jordan Pacheco. A swing and a miss down, strike one. Pacheco, 30 years old, has spent the last year and a half in the Diamondbacks organization after coming up with Colorado, and he'll be thrown out to in the inning. So a double by K, but he's left at third. We're on to the seventh. Cleveland in front, three to one.
Cincinnati Bill, April 4th through the 7th at Great American Ballpark. Don't miss it. Lots of giveaways and fireworks. We have the team calendar, Red's blanket, magnetic schedule, and car magnet giveaways, and much, much more. A kid's opening day. Call for tickets now at 3 and one reds Visit select Kroger locations or log on to Reds.com. 28-year-old came over in the deal for Aroldis Chapman from the Yankees. Pitched in 12 games at the big league level last year. Going all the way back to 2009. Caleb Cottom was a New York Yankee farm man. Uh, the Yankees drafted him out of Vanderbilt 2009 in the fifth round. That was a record that you see for him. He has... It's primarily out of the bullpen, Caleb has. Last year, split time between double-A, triple-A, and what you said in his 12 games with the Yankees. Red's got four players in return for a role as Chapman, all minor league players. Pacheco charging, and that's a nice play. Jordan had a tough day yesterday committing a couple of errors at third, but that's a good play. Well, it was written about in one of the stories surrounding the Reds today in the Reds' notes that one of the things that Jordan Pacheco has going for him is versatility. For the second day in a row, he plays third base, but he call, can also catch, play around the infield and the outfield. not seen Devin Mezzarocco in uniform and playing yet. Don't be alarmed though, he's expected to catch sometime later in the week, maybe even into the weekend. But it's worth it's a situation worth keeping an eye on when a guy comes back from surgery. I know that they're gonna bring him along very slowly, deliberately to make sure that he doesn't overextend himself. So in the meantime, that opens up some opportunity for some other catchers around to get some playing time. to the count on Becker who bats for the first time since coming into the game as a replacement. Caleb makes his home in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. You ever been down there? Have not. Do you know where it is? I'm going to take a look because I am not sure. It's the second time we have gone to the well in, uh, in as many days looking for a town in Tennessee. It's in northern Tennessee. That's well, a suburb of Nashville, I, I would guess. That ball is out of here. Opposite field home run to make it a 4-1 to Indians game. And Indians lead. And you would be right. 17 miles east of downtown Nashville is Mount Juliet in Wilson County, Tennessee. One of those high sliders. And when you provide the height and they just kind of roll up there, all that batter's got to do is put a level swing on it.
Good breaking ball there for the second out of the inning. Yeah, Mount Juliet, the official city slogan is the city between the lakes. That's why I ask you, Chris, talk about this pitch first. That's a really good breaking ball right there for Coffin. He's got a fastball, mostly sinking fastball, not overpowering. He throws it anywhere from 88 to 91, 92. He's got a slider, but the best pitch is that hard curveball that he throws. You are quite the, uh, the outdoorsman and the fisherman, but Mount Juliet is known as the city between the lakes, reflecting the city's proximity to Old Hickory Lake, the Cumberland River, to its north and Percy Priest Lake, which comes off the Stones River to the south. Both are man-made reservoirs. Hmm. You haven't been there? Have not. All right. Any golf courses down that neck of the woods? Asking the wrong guy, doctor. You would know. I mean, you are very familiar with not only the Volunteer State, but Kentucky and certainly the Tar Heel State of North Carolina. <laughs> All Reds country in my mind. No question about it. Michael Martinez, we've seen him in the past with the Phillies, seen him a little bit with the Pirates. Started the game yesterday, bats for the first time today. Good spot right there. You know, when you come into a opposite hitting hitter, uh, the, the main spot is you aim it right underneath his elbow. Michael Martinez aggressively swings right over, and you might not come right back with the same pitch. So he allows a home run, but threw the ball pretty well there. Middle of the seventh. Reds trail the Indians 4-1. Well, we mentioned Kids Opening Day presented by Frisch's Big Boy. Arrive early and enjoy a pregame kids block party, interactive games. Walk the red carpet out of the fan zone. A lot going on. All kids 14 and younger receive a Reds cap thanks to Frisch's Big Boy. 381 REDS call for tickets. That's brand new on the docket. We've already, you know, you know about opening day. Recent years, very successful. We have opening night. I like that. And now we're having the first ever Kids Opening Day that first Sunday of the season, the final game of that season opening homestand. Great idea. Yep. Kyle Crockett, a left-hander out of the University of Virginia. Man, was this guy good in 2014. First time he came to the big leagues. 
a 1.8 ERA in 43 games. Last year, not so kind. And there goes the bat. Look out. Oh, boy. It appears as though everybody uh, is okay. Now they were in a rush to initially run that bat right back down to the batter. But the gentleman that was hit on the hip with that bat said, hey, wait a minute here. I got a black and blue spot right here that could be made to feel a lot better if I just hold on to that timber. Looks like he's going to be all right. It's a pretty good toss. By Galvin Lavalley. Twenty-one-year-old, a native of Oklahoma. Fourth round pick by the Reds in 2014. That ball is stunk. And the big fella will cruise into second base with a double. 6'3", 220 pounder. Well, he's down from what he was when he played high school football. He was up around 270. That ball's hit very hard. Now the aforementioned Juan Duran. Brought up earlier, if you weren't with us, Duran will be suspended for the first half of this season. Young man the Reds have been waiting on. He's 24 years old. They signed him as a 16-year-old out of the Dominican Republic going all the way back to 2008. There have been years he's put together where you're like, well, he, he's very close. That one fouled off and out of play the other way. Had some very good years. Single-A date. Good power numbers, anyway, in Bakersfield. Low batting average, very low on base percentage. It's really tough for a guy who is as tall as Juan Duran. I mean, he was... He was almost 16 years old when the Red signed him. Two days from his 16th birthday, Bob Miller was in the front office at the time with the Reds, and he saw a loophole in the way the, the rules are written, that if in his first year you turn 17, you can sign him. So the Reds got a head start on everybody else who wanted to sign Juan Duran. And they put him under contract. They spent a $2.5 million signing bonus. And Juan started growing and growing and growing, and he's now 6 feet 7 inches tall. <laughs> That's tough to cover a strike zone that big. Well, he is a mountain of a man standing in that right-handed batter's box. Big swing and a miss. He's out of there on strikes. One away in the inning. Well, the road trip to opening day. The skyline chilling in Oakley on Madison Avenue. Stop in for lunch next Wednesday. That's a nice skyline they have right there in Oakley Square. Very nice. I haven't met a skyline that wasn't nice. Very well put. Especially now that they have their vegetarian chili. You can get a veggie five-way. And I know you'll be ordering that next I time you're been in there. All winter long. Tyler hold bats for the first time. Runner at second. Reds trailing. Four to one batting here in the bottom of the seventh inning.
Hold 27 years old, claimed off waivers from these Indians. The final week of September last year, the Indians originally chose him in the 10th round out of Florida State University back in 2010. Came up, of course, for five games, 11 at-bats at the end of last year with the Reds. The year before, made his major league debut in Cleveland. Certainly, hold would be considered an oddity. Some might have a different word for it, as that one is carrying in a deep right center field. That's a nice catch made out there in center. And on to third base goes Lavalle, two away in the inning. And an oddity in the simple fact that Holt grew up in Gainesville, Florida, which is the home of the Florida Gators, the University of Florida. Yet he elected to pack his bags and play collegiately for the Seminoles in Tallahassee. You don't see much of that. You're right about that. That might be a household divided. Well, it's like half would be a dramatization, but not much of one. Some of the greatest football players in the history of the University of Michigan came from Ohio. Now, you're crossing borders there. You may as well be crossing borders if you grow up in Gainesville and you go to Florida mm -hmm. State. It's the mm -hmm. same kind of thing. Ironically, the same would not be said the other way. Although I understand the, uh, the young man who's going to be the starting tailback for the Buckeyes this year is a young man from Michigan. And they are saying, look out. There's a little pop-up down the right field line, and it falls in for a hit. And an RBI for a number one pick a couple of years ago, Philip Irvin. And that makes it a 4-2 to two Cleveland lead. And speaking of football players, he was a former football player. Philip Irvin was, came out of Samford University. Reds got him in 2013. Little scribber off the end of the bat picks up an RBI and he to first base. I remember Urban got off to that incredible start mm -hmm. last year, and uh, everybody was so excited. He was a 27th overall pick in June of 2013, and Chris, uh, he's gone rookie ball, single A, full year in Dayton where he hit 237. To 242 in Dayton last year, combined his numbers with Pensacola to drive in 71 runs. 21 doubles and 14 home runs, but a very, very low batting average. He does have a pretty high on-base percentage. That was up over 400 last year in Pensacola. That ball misplayed and will lead to the third Reds run of the game. Ray Atlas, a routine fly ball that should have been caught. I'm wondering if he may have lost that yeah. ball in the sun. We're getting to the point in the afternoon where the sun begins to go down, and I was noticing him out there kind of testing it with his glove almost after every pitch. This ball looks like it just gets right in there. You can see him kind of shielding his face away. Of course, that will go down as a base hit. That's Shane Robinson. He's been around for a while. And normally he's a pretty dependable mm -hmm. player. Yeah. So I think you're right, Chris. I mean, he just made a really nice play in right center a minute ago. So now Hudson tying run out there at second base. Reds have scored twice in this bottom of the seventh inning to come within a run.
Hudson played for his second season in a row last year in Dayton. It's Reds A ball ball club. He Reds picked him out of the draft 2012 out of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Strike three call. Reds get two. We move to the eighth. The Indians lead by one. atop the stadium now in the Reds box and my uh, pleasure to welcome in everyone knows this guy Lou Pinello the manager of the 1990 world champion Cincinnati Reds back in the organization in an advisory role and uh, I'll tell you what there's a lot of people excited to see you back uh, what was it like putting on that Reds uniform again well it felt good it really did uh, Cincinnati's a great sports town and uh, the Reds are bigger than life uh, I hadn't had a uniform on in about six years so but it's starting to feel comfortable, and I, uh, I've been very impressed, by the way, with this camp. Uh, these kids have worked hard. It's very well organized, and, uh, you know, I know that the, the Reds traded away some of their veteran players last year, but I've been impressed with these young kids. I, I don't really want to get into the particulars of whom or what, but uh, at the same time, listen, uh, uh, they're listening to the coaches, or they're playing hard, and uh, I think a, a lot of good things are going to happen this year. Your advisory role, uh, what specifically is going to be your duties going forward, and how can you help this club? Well, look, uh, I was hired here uh, to uh, help Brian and, and his coaching staff just to offer suggestions of, uh, uh, about the lineups, uh, about the talent level, et cetera. Uh, and like I told Brian, I'll give you my opinions, and if you like them, use them, and if you don't, you can discard them. Uh, uh, you know, Brian was my pitching coach in Seattle, and he did such a great job for me. So I hope that uh, the input that I have with he and his staff, uh, I can help. At the same time, uh, uh, Walt, uh, with uh, uh, all his, uh, all the trades that they made with all these young kids and so forth, he, he says, look, uh, why don't you uh, uh, help evaluate them? And, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, those two things specifically, I'll be here in spring training probably till the, the 12th or so of March. And then uh, I'll go home, and I'll be joining the club uh, 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 five or six, seven days uh, uh, every month. And uh, and uh, if he needs me to go down to double A or triple A to take a look at those players, we'll do that too. So, look, I'm excited. I really am. Uh, it's great to have a uniform on again. The Reds. I wear my uh, wearing my championship ring here with a lot of pride, and it's great. I've got players like Eric Davis here and, and Barry Larkin and Billy Hatcher so and, and Billy Doran uh, nice it really is it's been a nice experience for me well let me give you a shot at this question has anyone caught your eye yeah they have they really have I mean look uh, you've got some young pitchers here uh, uh, that uh, to me and this is early uh, I, I can help this situation out and at the same time uh, some young players that uh, uh, look, uh, the, the, the kid to me that uh, down the line uh, really looks like he's, he's, he's going to be really good uh, offensively and, and, a, and a, a, a good major league player is uh, uh, the, the number one pick uh, from Florida. 
uh, Winkler. Uh, good looking young, but uh, look, I, I've been impressed with a lot of these kids. But again, you know, I've only seen two games. Uh, but look, there's some talent here. There's no question. Uh, now, whether they turn into Barry Larkins and Eric Davis, is, I'm not so sure, but uh, certainly uh, good competitive major league players. Yeah, there are a few of them here. Do you realize how beloved you are in Reds country? And I'll take you back. You, you attended Reds Fest, and by far the biggest cheer. You would think the star players might have gotten the biggest applause, but it was you. Do you feel the love from Reds fans? Well, look, I I, uh, I felt it. Yeah, I really did. I Look, uh, they're wonderful fans, no question. I mean, uh, uh, this year here, uh, uh, I'm going to be the grand marshal of the, of the parade. Uh, that's a, a, a heck of a nice honor bestowed on me. And at the same time, throwing out the first pitch. Now, I'm going to have to get my arm rubbed a few times. I, I don't know if I can get it up there from 60 feet, 6 inches. But, yeah, listen, uh, 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 when I was in Cincinnati, the fans treated me exceptional. Uh, you know, we were fortunate there uh, my first year that we won a world championship. And, and, and uh, had exciting teams for the, for the years I was there. So I'm glad to be back. I really am. Well, you seem reinvigorated. You look great, and uh, we are so honored to have you back in the in the red system. And uh, it's uh, we really appreciate the time. Well, thank you so much. I'm the one that's honored, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, these kids here perform uh, to uh, their advanced billing, and uh, the Reds have a an exciting and, and winning season this year. That's Lou Pinella, guys, and uh, if there's someone that uh, young players can soak up knowledge from, he's first in line. Well, there's no debate about that. I mean, you talk about everything you can do as far as working in the game of baseball. Lou, of course, was an outstanding player for a long, long time, originally drafted by Kansas City and then moved on at his great years with the Yankees. He's worked as a broadcaster. He's worked as a coach. He's worked as a general manager. He's worked as a field manager where he's won a world championship with the Reds, taking, what, three different teams to the playoffs, the Reds, the Mariners, and the Cubs. So there's a lot to learn from Mr. Pinello. Well, no doubt. And you know what I really like about Lou, though? Whether you're talking to him in an interview or whether you're just, you know, shooting it back and forth yep. with him, he doesn't talk in diplomatic double talk where he says a bunch no. of stuff and never says anything. I mean, he'll tell you. And uh, it, it just, I think people appreciate that about Lou, and that's one reason why they like him. Mm -hmm. We had a chance to do uh, a lot of our baseball tech talks down here, and we did a whole series with Lou. Not from managing. Most people remember Lou as a manager, of course, but as a hitter. I mean, he sure. was a 291 hitter in a long and very successful major league career. And, boy, he gave some great batting tips and terrific drills, drills that I never heard of before, that uh, we will be showing those throughout the season. We thank him for helping us. Mm-hmm. One of the all-time greats. Very funny, fun to be around. Nice breaking ball there by Heba Sampson. You did some tech talks with this young man. Yeah, sure did. He's got a, he's got a pretty good idea, Kivas does. And I think he also has a pretty good idea of where he may fit on this Reds ball club. He had a lot of starts last year. I'm not so sure that he's in the mix for starting rotation this year. But he knows what he has to do. Speaking of football in Florida and Florida State, he was committed to go to Florida State before being drafted and eventually signed by the Padres. Well, he put together a very nice season in double-A and triple-A before being brought up to the Reds. And it wasn't like every time he went out there it was a disaster. He threw some good games, you may remember. But then, you know, that ERA blows up when you have two or three of those outings where you're going three and a third and you're giving up five or six. Yeah, you know what it, my observation of Kivas was? He had a hard time seeing the hitters multiple times in the ball game, which may make him more effective when you come in in relief and you're only seeing them once in one inning. And you can do that right yeah. there. I think it also elevates his fastball a little bit, velocity-wise. You know, when you're a starter, sometimes you save something back for the second and the third time you're through the, you know, through the lineup. 
not a lot of movement on his fastball. So once you start seeing him several times, it becomes more hittable. I think he'll be much better served in short stints. Tyler Naquin got the start in yesterday's game. Strike one. Breaking ball there by Sampson to get ahead 0 and 2. Reds will play the Indians again tomorrow. No television tomorrow. Anthony DiSclefani gets his first start. Jonathan Sanchez. Now there's an interesting name, Chris. A young man who at one time threw a no-hitter pitching for the San Francisco Giants. Recent years has gone through some arm injuries. He's not pitched in the big league since 2013. But Pat Kelly saw him in winter ball down in Puerto Rico. Gave good reports to the Reds about him and they decided to take a flyer and give him a chance to come in here and win a spot somewhere on this Red staff. Really a, a no-lose situation for a ball club like the Reds to bring Jonathan Sanchez in. They, what they don't have a lot of in the bullpen is veteran arms. So if Sanchez looks good, he may have a shot at it. Breaking ball, swung on and missed. Sampson allows a hit but strikes out three. Boy, he looked good. Breaking ball, fastball. Reds are down a run. They'll bat the bottom of the eighth when we come back. You asked about the art of the deal, and one of the best lessons I learned from Walt is separating the, the teams that are serious about a deal from the ones that aren't. And Because um, you'll get a lot of calls, players available, and, and a lot of people are just calling to try to find out information, and they're not really serious. Well, if you're interested in some of those comments, there's a lot more to it. Tonight at 7, grab a seat at the Reds' roundtable. Walt Jockety, Dick Williams will join Jim Day and me and go inside the minds of the Reds' front office. We'll talk about, you know, the Reds' philosophy on building a team, the art of making a deal, and a lot more than that. Reds' roundtable follows an all-new Reds Weekly. That's going to be a great show as well. Tonight, immediately after our telecast today.
Well, the Reds will bat here in the bottom half of the eighth inning. And Giovanni Soto. No, that's not the converted right-handed throwing catcher. This is a left-handed pitcher for the Cleveland Indians. Cave trying to bunt his way on. Thrown out. One away. Cave already three hits in the first two days of Cactus League games. Two as a starter yesterday and a long double into right center field off the bench his first time up today. Now Blandino. What are your reports on Blandino? Good fielder. Came up as a shortstop. They think he's better suited for second base, and he has to start producing with the bat to get himself into the contention to, to break into the big leagues. Oh, yeah. Hit 294 in Dayton last year, but then when they moved him up to double A, only a 235 batter did have an on base percentage of over 350. So he'll take a walk. Mm -hmm. Well, we mentioned you're talking about a player who was drafted in the supplemental part of the first round. Actually, a 29th overall pick, I beg your pardon. He was a legitimate first-round pick out of a very high level of collegiate baseball for the Stanford Cardinal. Normally, you like seeing those guys, Chris, get through that system pretty quickly. Yeah, you do, Tom, but you have to remember that at the big league level over the last five years, there have been very little movement at all at, in the infield. We've had Todd Frazier, you've had Zach Cozart, you've had Brandon Phillips, and you've had uh, Joey Votto. So until you see turnover at the big league level, you don't see guys being called up in the minor league level. So you hit a roadblock. And this is part of the problem the Reds have had in their organization is they have not gotten guys into the higher levels of the minor leagues because of the lack of turnover. And when we have seen it this year, it's been dramatic, obviously. Well, really, in the grand scheme of things, if you still look at the infield for the Reds this year, uh -huh. there is very little turnover. Yeah. There's only one open spot now that uh, Zach Kozard is coming back from injury, and it's really not an open spot at third. Right. Because last year's shortstop, Suarez, is moving to third base. Good breaking ball here for the second out of the inning. Told you we're not going to be on again until Tuesday, March the 15th. The Reds will take on the world champion Kansas City Royals at 4 o'clock Eastern time. We're on the march to opening day right here on Fox Sports Ohio presented by Steele. Two away for Jordan Pacheco here in the Reds' eighth inning. Ball one. Soto, 24 years old, from Puerto Rico, pitched six scoreless games, three and a third scoreless innings, breaking into the major leagues for the first time last year with the Indians. He's become an exclusive reliever just the last two years of his career, and they have been very, very good years working his way up through the minor league system. That is a mighty dandy breaking ball right there. Two two pitch. That breaking ball just slipped right off his fingertips. You could see when he released the ball. Full count on Pacheco. It's 
One of the players Lou Pinella referred to a moment ago, one of the great stars of all time in Reds franchise history, Eric Davis. You mentioned yesterday, Chris, all the time that he puts in with these young players. And that's been for a number of years now for Davis. You know, you get the feeling that, that a lot of guys just get baseball in their blood, and you just can't get it out. I mean, the Reds aren't paying Eric Davis a ton of money to hang around. I mean, he's not making baseball player money anymore. But just the love for the game and the, the love to be able to help a youngster get better, have an impact on him, just means so much. I mean, these are long days out here in spring training. I mean, coaches and players report to the ballpark. Well, some of them are here at 6.30 in the morning. I mean, most coaches are here by 7. And by the time you get out of here after a, a three-hour game in the afternoon, you're looking at getting home for dinner time. What do you do? Eat? And then go to bed. Sounds like a Marty Brenneman schedule. It's about right. Although he's very, very busy. He's got a lot going on. He does. More now than ever. You and him are a lot alike in that regard. Well, we we both have the same kind of pets. In fact, we're wondering when you're going to get a broadcaster dog. You know, I have a couple of Maltese. Cowboy has a couple of Maltese. Your right. dad now has Millie. Not Maltese. in the cards for me. And I get those big dogs from the pound. Yeah. You know, we, we, we found one that was shot in the field down in Kentucky. We found Stella's 80 pounds of love at the SPCA Cincinnati. That one thrown away. And they're going to hold the runner at third base. That would be the tying run down there. Play that should have been made there in this bottom half of the eighth inning, but wasn't. And now Juan Duran will get a chance to not only tie the game, but perhaps give the Reds a lead with a base hit. Struck out his first time up. Ball one away. Of course, the Indians are going through a similar type situation as the Reds are with Duran. Although it will certainly have a greater impact on the Major League Club for Cleveland than with the Reds because... Abraham Almonte was scheduled to vie for playing time as a regular in center field before he was suspended last week. Mm -hmm. Two on, two out. One ball, one strike. Low and inside, two and one. You know, you hear a lot of cliches in spring training. One of my favorite cliches recently, especially with the, the suspensions for testing positive, is I take full responsibility, but I have no idea how it got in my body. Hard hit ball. Nice play by the shortstop. And that'll end the inning. One run game, we go to the night. Hi, I need a safe car.
NASCAR heads to Las Vegas. It starts on Saturday. The Xfinity Series racing on FS1. Special guest Clint Boyer will be in the broadcast booth. And then on Sunday, the Cobalt 400, 3 Eastern on Fox, streaming live on Fox Sports Go. My main man, Daddy Mize. Mark Mize are going to be down in the pit. Pit row for that Las Vegas race. Well, if you weren't with us earlier today, we saw the top two pitching prospects in the Reds organization begin this game. Robert Stevenson, your thoughts on him today? Two scoreless innings, Chris. Very impressive what Stevenson showed me. Three pitches, all plus-plus pitches. Uh, got a two of his strikeouts on off speed. Uh, very, very impressive. Reed gave up a run or so, but, I mean, he still threw the ball extremely well. And life on his fastball. He's only a two-pitch pitcher. So, you know, in development, you may think that Maybe Stevenson is a little bit ahead of him because he's developed the third pitch. But boy, Reed is uh, deceptive, overpowering at times. I want to see more of both of them. And we will. Well, here's another pitcher we saw a lot of last year for the Reds, Carlos Contreras. Pitched in 22 games, a 4.80 ERA. He's pitched in parts uh, of each of the last two years at the big league level for the Reds. Still only 25 years old. You know, he's one he's one of these uh, under the radar kind of guys, mm -hmm. Tom. You know, Ryan Matthews we we're talking about as a middle reliever that can come on in and and eat some innings up for you, take the pressure off other guys. Contreras just seems to have gotten a little bit better every year. A little better command, a little better breaking pitches. Never going to be a, a pitcher where he throws, you know, in the high 90s where you're going to project him at the end of the bullpen. Joey Butler, the batter for the Indians, leading things off here in the ninth. Cleveland with a one-run lead. Three balls and two strikes on Butler. And he draws a walk to begin the inning. Yeah, that's been one of the problems for Contreras along the way. I mean, his stuff is good enough. But it's his ability to throw the ball where he wants to. In 39 innings last year in AAA, he walked 30. In 22 or 28 innings last year with the Reds, he walked 20. So by far, way too much out of the strike zone to be consistently looked at as a big league pitcher. Shane Robinson will bat. the end of the bat, a fly ball to left field. Oh, carried a long way, and it's caught out there at the warning track by Urban for out number one. You certainly don't have to square it up to hit it very far here in Arizona. Oh, really carries. Oh, you brought a great point yesterday, Chris. You know, it's one thing to have to navigate all of these young pitchers or at least guys that are trying to win a spot in the rotation or you know the the Reds bullpen and not all of them are young guys we've seen some guys that have been around a while that are are also trying to win jobs you know Jonathan Sanchez the guy that'll fit that bill tomorrow but you know how hard is it to evaluate because of what you talked about yesterday is you know the, the breaking ball for an example it's not going to have the same bite on it yeah you, you're I mean you're right the breaking ball doesn't break here balls uh, get lost in the sun more than they do during the regular season uh, the ball flies more because of the light air and the other thing is that at, towards the end of the ball game I mean you're looking at really somewhere between a double-a and a triple-a baseball game and the personnel involved 
So you sent out a guy trying to make the big league team, and he's pitching against, you know, the double-A team that the Indians are sending sure. out there. So how do you really handicap all of that together? And in, in the mind of a lot of organizations now, some of that can be answered with the use of raw data. How fast is the fastball? How much is the breaking ball break? So whether you're pitching against double-A teams or big league teams, they say, hey, he's got big league stuff. But until you really see it against big leaguers, that's kind of what I want to see. How does he do it in a real game? You know, where there's 40,000 in the stands instead of 4,000 in the stands. Two and two. I had to throw to first. One on, one out against Contreras here in the top of the ninth inning. Four runs, eight hits for the Indians. Three runs, six hits for the Reds. And there is strike three called. Good fastball by Carlos for out number two. Can't go wrong with this spot right here. Down and away. Well, that's the kind of pitch as a pitcher that I remember Sammy Ellis telling me a long time ago. You thought you throw one good one of those in the bullpen. He says, now, all you've got to do is run that off 20,000 more times, same spot, and you'll be okay. <laughs> he was quite a character. Saw him a little bit over the Did you time. really? Yeah. Former 20-game winner for the Reds back oh, in the mid-60s. Fun guy. Oh, great guy. Really, really enjoyable guy to be around. That's fair ball, and that's final out of the inning. Zach Walters doing some umpiring at the plate, and he's out of luck. Well, the Reds will try and win it. They trail by one. They back into the bottom of the night. Reds fans, baseball is back. So are Super Saturdays. The first one's coming up April the 9th. The Reds take on the Pirates. Now, come on down early. If you're one of the first 20,000 fans, you'll take home a Reds fleece blanket. Thanks to our friends at Coca-Cola. 513-381-REDS. The number to dial. Those things are normally one of the better giveaway items. And there are a lot of them. But that is one of the best giveaway items we have year in and year out. Those things are nice. And they come in handy. Sitting around on a chilly night in the wintertime. Watching a tube, watching a little hoops or something. Have that handy. First, next time we're on the air, we will be uh, two days away from the NCAA basketball tournament getting started. 
We'll be here the 15th, our next television game against Kansas City. That one lofted into right center field. And that'll be a base hit for Holt. He'll slam on the brakes after a big turn. So the Reds have a leadoff man aboard to begin the bottom of the ninth inning. Down a run against left-hander Ryan Merritt. Big breaking ball. Merritt hangs up in the air. Holt does what he ought to do with it. Takes it the other way and drops it in for a base knock. Now Philip Urban to bat it. goes pitch taking a strike throw to second is not going to be in time so hold a single and a stolen base to put himself in the scoring position got a big jump right there on a very deliberate move to the plate now Irvin needs to get him over Well, these are the little things that Brian Price has been talking about before camp ever began. And obviously, he wants his team to win more games than it did a year ago, but he wants to see and has really emphasized a great deal of importance and a lot of drills and a lot of time on the little things in baseball that can often, you know, mean the difference between winning and losing games. You have a runner at second with nobody out. Now, does Urban want to hit one in the seats to give him the lead and the win? Of course he does. But at the minimum, can he get him over? And the answer is yes. And Mike get an infield hit to boot. And he does. The ball gets away, and the Reds are going to tie the game. 4-4 Four -four on the infield single and then the throwing air. I'm sure Brian Price will be very, very pleased with that effort by Irvin. Good job by Irvin. Had a 1-1 count on him, and he knew it right away. As soon as Holt gets the second base, it changes his entire at-bat. So now Irvin, who is speedy enough to have a lot of stolen bases, I think he had 36 last year, whether he might be off and running in this at-bat. There he goes. And look at this. Hit and run. It's going to send Ember Urban to third base. Blake Trahan. Now that is fundamental baseball. Beautifully done. And the Reds have the winning run 90 feet away with nobody out at the bottom of the ninth inning. Well, on a hit and run, you want to make sure you make contact. You preferably hit it on the ground and even more so to the vacating spot in the infield where the fielder was, but now he's covering the bag. Irvin with plenty of speed to go first to third, so perfect execution by the Reds. The youngsters here on the verge of coming back to win this ball game. And now Joe Hudson with a chance to give the Reds a win. We're tied at four, infield in, outfield not all the way in. Surprising, uh, they're as deep as they are. Yeah. I mean, there's a fly ball right now to center field, and maybe even to left field. The way Urban runs, you have no chance of throwing him out, even if they catch it right where they're standing. Mm -hmm. Got to put it in play. Wow. And safe to call it first. And Hudson thinking, well, I can't hit it any harder than that. That's a nice play by Merritt on the mound. And ball may have caught him. Nice play by his glove. <laughs> Look what I found. 
Check your other hand. You got a gold watch. <laughs> Well, Jake Cave already has three hits this spring. One of them came against a left-hander. That was yesterday, and it was a little blooper into left field. He'd settle for another one of those at the very minimum right now. Strike one. Breaking ball away, and again, uh, you know, where the outfielders are playing right now. Well, it's actually pretty good news for Kay because if he can just float one out there, he'll drop it in front of him as deep as they are playing with one away and the winning run at third here in the ninth. Oh, boy. Strike two. Cave did not like that call. Thought it was high. Roberto Ortiz, our home plate umpire today. Merritt trying to pitch his way out of big trouble. Two and two on Cave. You can't put into words what at bats like this mean to a guy like Cave. Trying to impress a new organization. Win a spot on a big league club. And he just took strike three. He didn't swing the bat the entire trip to the plate. He took all three strikes. Two away in the inning. Or he may have thought that was low, but with a winning run at third base, you got to put that ball in play. Well, I wonder if they're going to end this game in a tie if the Reds don't score because the Reds don't have anybody getting loose in the yeah. bullpen. I'm not sure they have anybody else available at this point to pitch out of the bullpen. Unless somebody's ready and we didn't see him getting warmed up. Well, they only dressed 60 today. Yeah, you look at that dugout, it looks like a football sideline <laughs> down there. And half of them are, have already gone home. Well, the runner will take second base, and it's one and one on Alex Blandino. Well, he can make all this debate a moot point. Mm -hmm. With a game-ending base hit. 4-4 four, four tie. Winning run at third. He was there with nobody out. Now there with two out. Two and one. Jordan Pacheco would be next. It's three balls and a strike to Alex Blandino. Strike two. Straight up in the air. Should in the inning. So while the Reds tie the game, they fail to win the game. As they leave the tying run at third, Terry Francona is looking over at Brian Price saying, that's it. Saying, uh, we're done. And Brian Price says, yeah, that's it. So we are done. Assuming that's what that signal means. And normally that's exactly what it is. So the Reds do tie the game in the bottom of the ninth inning. 
And the game ends in a 4-4 decision. Well, Mr. Welsh, it's been mighty fun getting back together with you again, my friend. Our 10th year together coming up. Counting down to opening day in Cincinnati against the Philadelphia Phillies. Looking forward to our next game, Tom, on March the 15th. And then, of course, one more before we take off back to Cincinnati on the 25th of March. But uh, enjoy the last couple of games. Good to be back with you, my man. And uh, have a safe drive back to the other side of Phoenix. Will do. And a safe flight back home. You and Polly heading back. Uh, Likewise for you and Bill. All right. All right. Don't forget, still a full lineup of uh, of Reds TV, if you will. We have, you know, a new edition of Reds Weekly. We have that Reds Roundtable with Walt Jockety and Dick Williams and Jim Day and me. And so we invite you to stick around for that. Thank Josh Hall, our producer. Brian Hunterman, our director. For Chris Welch, Jim Day, and our entire crew. Tom Brenneman, thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you on the 15th. The following is an urgent